It's Area 51, but underwater. And it could be hiding a big secret. We had a radar contact pop up that appeared to be a landmass where no landmass should exist. Are these USOs extraterrestrial? Or are they advanced craft reverse engineered by the US Navy? Did you feel that was something you were not supposed to see? Absolutely. I don't think we're really welcome here, guys. For the first time ever, former employees of this top secret base break their silence. I've seen an entity twice, but definitely it's alive. Our investigation takes us to the edge of the Bermuda Triangle. And possible proof of an alien civilization. Right there, we're over something. We're over something, Mike. This is case number 59106, Underwater Area 51. We're in the Bahamas now, investigating a UFO connection around a real American military installation called AUTEC. AUTEC stands for the Atlantic Undersea Test and Evaluation Center. It was opened in 1967. It's on Andros Island, a remote location in the Bahamas. It sits on what's called the tongue of the ocean. This is a deep ocean basin that's roughly 110 nautical miles long, 20 nautical miles wide, and reaches depths of 6,000 feet. It's a perfect spot for testing new top secret weapons, submarines, and other exotic underwater craft. Is it a coincidence that ever since AUTEC was constructed, UFO and USO reports in the area have skyrocketed? And it's even stranger that AUTEC happens to be located on the cusp of the Bermuda Triangle. We're going to AUTEC, the Atlantic Undersea Testing and Evaluation Center. This is the Navy's Area 51. A lot of people haven't even heard of AUTEC. It's so top secret. And uh, we're lucky we're actually going to be able to talk to a few former AUTEC employees who are coming forward for the first time with their own USO sightings. From what we know, AUTEC has three test ranges. They carry out integrated three-dimensional aerospace and hydrospace trajectory measurements of weapons, acoustic, and sonar technology. They even set up an electronic warfare threat simulator, essentially a place to conduct undersea war games. Well, you know, I don't see AUTEC as being quite the secret that Area 51 is. I mean, after all, they have a website. Now, maybe this is one of those right before your very eyes type of deals. Underneath it all is something very, very secret. And I've always wondered, since this is near the Bermuda Triangle and since there is so much USO and UFO activity, is there a relationship between USO and UFO activity and AUTEC? this center on the edge of the Bermuda Triangle. My name is Kurt Rowlett. I'm a former Autech employee. On one evening, we pulled out of the dock here, suddenly, out of nowhere, we had a radar contact pop up directly in front of our ship that appeared to be a landmass where no landmass should exist. Kurt Rowlett was an employee of Autech back in 1985. But years before that, in 1980, he was in the Coast Guard where he worked in the vicinity of Autech and he witnessed what he now describes as a gigantic USO coming out of the water. Well, could you tell us about this night that you uh, encountered this object? Back to my Coast Guard days, we pulled away from the Autec dock. It was well after nightfall, and I'm at the helm watch, and suddenly the officer of the watch tells me, hey, I've got a radar contact showing land dead ahead about three miles. That's something that's patently impossible because we're in the tongue of the ocean, and it's a thousand fathoms deep. Is it possible this could have been something related to the military? 
I don't think so. This is more along the lines of the size of an island. Now, landmass three miles wide is huge. So to put this into perspective, the island of Manhattan at its widest point is 2.3 miles. So we're talking about a landmass wider than Manhattan. Subsequently, at the same time, the compass began to swing wildly, completely out of control. Couldn't believe my eyes. You know, what am I, what am I looking at? What's happening? Am I in any sort of danger? So the compass was going wild. It was going wild when it shouldn't be because wow. it's a calibrated compass and it's steadfast, you know. And was anything seen with, with eyes and binoculars? Not a thing. No visual contact? Not a thing, but it was certainly entered into the ship's log as a, a legitimate incident that happened on board. And that's something that doesn't go into the log unless the captain takes it seriously. We've heard this sort of thing before. We talked with uh, Ray Bowyer, who saw two giant objects over the English Channel. We were at 4,000 feet. I could see the objects. The roughly how big? Do you have any idea? No, I'd say at least a mile across. We talked with Charles uh, Dubac, uh, the French pilot who saw uh, a huge uh, disc over Paris. The dimension was huge, absolutely huge. We're getting a more complete picture with this uh, count of Kurt Rowlett that these objects can not only be in the skies, but may also be able to uh, descend into the water and, and surface and, and be caught on radar. So how long was this landmass there? Well, it stayed on the screen for about three minutes. And at that point, it started to actually literally dissolve off of the radar screen. The exact same time, I get the compass back. Would you identify it as an unidentified submerged object coming up and then dropping again? That would make the most sense because a radar only picks up objects that are actually on the surface of the sea. Essentially, it would have to have been below the ocean, above sea level, and then dropping below sea level again. And this was right here with the tongue of the ocean? About halfway between the Autec base and the north end of the island here. Kurt Rowlett tells a great story, and he's a very credible witness, but this could possibly be explained by a radar malfunction, a top secret submarine that the Navy was testing, or even an experiment with a massive false radar target. How rare is an event like this? I would say pretty darn rare. An object one to three miles wide in an area as restricted as Autec, it means Autec had to know about it. Perhaps it was a craft from Autec itself, or perhaps it was from somewhere else. The fact is he's not the first Autec employee to witness an unexplainable craft in the tongue of the ocean. I was standing on the ramp of a torpedo retriever boat, and that's when I saw the object rise up from the depths. I, I really didn't know what to think of it, and it could be something uh, not from this world. We're about to meet David Malcolm, a former Ortec employee who had a really eerie and strange experience one day when he was sent out to pick up torpedoes, but found himself staring at something else. My job title was a weapons technician, and our job was to go out, collect the torpedoes and missiles after they were fired, and recover them, bring them back into the, the base. One particular day, probably the winter of 72 to 73, we were uh, in the middle of a test and recovering of uh, one of the torpedoes, and I saw a submerged object that rose out of the depth and came into my field of vision. And just as quickly as it arose, it seemed to just vanish. Can you describe it for us? Uh, the best description I could give you would be uh, cylinders, a collection of pipes. I really should say, I, I didn't get a clear sense of the length of this thing. I actually don't believe I saw either end of this. You have a limited visibility in the water. So this could have been huge. It could have been huge. This could very well be the same craft that Kurt Rowlett saw on his radar screen, which he said was one to three miles wide. And just like Rowlett's sighting, the object Malcolm saw disappeared within seconds. And I'm sure you see cylinders uh, under the water often in torpedoes and submarines. What made these cylinders so different from everything else? Uh, they were completely different. The cylinders that I would have been familiar with would have been nuclear submarines and the weapons they fired. This was neither. Dave Malcolm was an Autec employee and an expert in conventional underwater craft. 
So when he sees something that he can't identify under the water, it speaks volumes as to how odd this really was. However, I still don't think this was an extraterrestrial craft. Or did it physically break the surface? Never broke the surface. Did you see any turbulence around it, splashes? Dead cop. Was that rise and fall something that you typically see in something like a submarine? Sub would have a tendency to, to come up on a, on a more gradual uh, incline. Did we have anything back then, to your knowledge, that could have moved that quickly underwater? To my knowledge, at that time, we didn't have anything that could move like that. It was something in the water that, in my opinion, at that time, shouldn't have been in the water. If Autech was testing something out there near, near your vessel, wouldn't they notify crews and other ships out there that they were doing some testing? Not necessarily. Uh, it, a lot had to do with the need to know. So if, if you didn't have a specific need to know to accomplish your job function, you weren't told about it. Did you feel that was something you were not supposed to see? Absolutely. Since Autech appears to be more accessible than Area 51, and since, according to their website, they offer public tours, let's drive right up to the front gates of Autech and see if we can get in. Well, gentlemen, we're here. This is Autech, wow. eh? This is really it. We have called them, we've emailed them, we've written them. We've asked for the public information officer, director of public affairs, we've contacted the Navy, we've even tried to contact the base commander. And you know what their response was? Nothing. Nobody's gonna ask about the super weapons that are gonna defeat anybody in the Persian Gulf. What I'd like to do is just walk right up to the gate and say, hey, where's the UFO? Hi, we're here. Show us the ET. Are we trying to get us busted here? There's a helicopter, guys. You can tell he's tilting this, this way. way. Slowing down. This is actually a little creepy. I don't think we're really welcome here, guys. Yeah, he's checking us out. We made it to the front gates of Autec. A helicopter flies over. A police car pulls up. Maybe a coincidence, maybe not. So obviously we really can't go much beyond this point. Those signs are very specific. Nobody allowed on the base for any reason whatsoever. Prudence might be the better part of valor. And we should probably pack up and leave. Okay. We've seen this thing from the land side. Now let's see it from the water side. I'm Mike Hornby, and there's definitely strange things going on above the water and below the water at Autech. Mike Hornby is a dive master with 13 years of experience diving the waters around Autech. He's going to take us to the ocean side of Autech and take me diving to find what's down there. Can you tell us some experiences you've had in these waters? I have uh, noted on numerous occasions, a weird presence of lights that did not behave in what I would call a consistent pattern. Some of the speed of which I've seen these move has uh, maybe stop and pause about what it may be. Not only has Mike Hornby seen UFOs and USOs, he's seen something strange connected to Autech. On this particular site, I had to abandon using an electronic uh, compass because every time I went into the water around the site, I found that I was getting inconsistent readings. Oftentimes, it would cut in and cut out. When I got out of the water, I found that it worked properly. First, Kurt Rowlett mentions a malfunctioning compass during his UFO sighting. And then Mike Hornby tells us that his compass goes haywire whenever he's diving near Autec. We are, after all, on the edge of the Bermuda Triangle where compass malfunctions happen all the time. Is this explainable in any way? There is presence of, of cables that are in the water. Are these power cables that you're talking about, or are these like steel cables? These are, these are uh, sheathed, steel-wrapped cables. 
They extend from the beginning of the dive sites from the shallow waters coming from Autac and continue out. Do we have any theories on, on what's on the other end of these cables? Or what have, these cables are used for? You cannot tell, at least I cannot tell by looking at them, what their purpose is. There's a lot of different theories as to what these cables can be. I mean, maybe they're used for sonar testing. Perhaps they're communication cables. Maybe there's some kind of craft tethered to the end of them. We need to trace the path of these cables and find out where they're coming from. And that's why Mike is trying to get us as close to Autec as possible. So how close to Autec will we actually be getting? Most as I get you is right along the breakwater. At what point did they get nervous? As soon as you enter through this gate. Right here? Yes. They have somebody stationed right down at the wharf. The minute somebody comes in there that's not authorized, the information goes out. So what's that sign say? Restricted area, keep out, authorized personnel only. It's a lot like what we read at Area 51. Exactly like Area 51. Now what about flying over Autec? Can you fly over it? Well, it's an MOA, so you're not supposed to. And certainly when they have their, their op operations in effect, uh, you don't want to be doing that because they're firing missiles off. Sure. An MOA is an acronym for a military operations area, indicating a restricted airspace exclusively for military aircraft. Just like Area 51, you can't get there by plane, you can't get there by land, and right now we're as close as we can get to Autec by water. We follow the cables all the way from Autec, and it's starting to get deep. I have to wonder what will be at the end of the line. We're over something, okay, Mike. Right stop. there, we're over something. Okay. Drop it right there. We have three guys who have seen strange objects in the waters near Autec. This cable may have something to do with what's going on around here. This is where we're going to descend into the water. We'll likely encounter sharks as we're descending. And then once we get in down at the bottom, we're going to be swimming towards a big coral mound. We're going over the side of the coral mound and we will in fact be picking up the cables. So the plan is we'll go down to about 120 feet and then out about 300 feet to the actual tongue of the ocean. Visibility is perfect, the seas are calm, and with our full tanks, we should be able to last about an hour underwater. We found the cable. It was thinner than I thought it was gonna be, but it really is odd seeing a cable coming from Autec and heading out into the open sea. According to Mike's story, his compass went haywire somewhere around here. Thankfully, our compasses and our dive computers are working fine. So we get out to the edge of the tongue of the ocean and we see that the cable disappears into the abyss. We're already at 120 feet and there's no way we can see the bottom. What'd you say? Well, we went to the very edge. It's like flying over the Grand Canyon. Except wow. you can't see the bottom. We follow the cables all the way to the very edge. And you just have to wonder where they go. The cable runs all the way from, from there, from Ante, all the way to the tongue of the ocean. So it's thousands of thousands of feet, depending on how deep that cable goes. Right, right, and who knows how long the cable runs along the ocean floor. So. Exactly. It could be a massive undertaking. Yeah. Autec is built on the tongue of the ocean, which is 6,000 feet deep, one of the deepest spots in the world. A suitable place for something to hide or for something secret to be tested. Even satellites can't spot what's down there. Now this cable adds to the mystery of Autec just a little bit, I think. Uh, yeah, you said it. What's interesting about the cable we found is that it doesn't look to be an underwater power cable. They're usually upwards of eight inches in diameter. 
This cable is more likely some form of a communications cable, which is closer to one and a half inches in diameter. But what's strange is why is it going into a 6,000 foot deep gorge? We physically tried to get into Autech, but it's impossible. So we found someone who has another way in. I've remote viewed for every major intelligence agency in America. I did see some USOs that were operating within the vicinity of Autech. Joseph McMonagle is a psychic spy employed by the US military for the past 30 years. He did remote viewing for the military during the Vietnam War and used his skills to predict the development of enemy weaponry during the Cold War. He's won the Army's very prestigious Legion of Merit Award. Some of the things that I, I remote viewed about Autech were somewhat different. Definitely not some technology that I'm aware of that we have. Remote viewing is a psychic ability. For example, a remote viewer standing in Washington, D.C. can view a top secret military installation in Russia and gather information about what's happening there. In the 1970s, the U.S. military started a top secret remote viewing program called Stargate, where they recruited actual psychics to remote view enemy territory, and Joseph McMonagall was the first psychic to be recruited. Can you give us any details, anything specific about what you saw? This, these particular objects that I've seen, they're uh, constructed of some metallic form. They have uh, pulsing lights on them. Uh, they're making erratic moves very quickly in the water. Uh, th the kinds of things that we just don't have the capacity to build. He sees strange objects, anomalous objects, out there hovering in the water, waiting, perhaps watching. These are not ours. These are probably not human. When you remote viewed these, were you able to perceive any entities inside these craft? I've seen an entity twice. Do you detect something mechanical in these figures? Uh, no, definitely it's alive. Could you describe it? I can give you a description of a three-fingered hand mm -hmm. that's uh, somewhat wrinkled. Uh, I've seen the, what I call skin suits, or the environmental suits that I think they wear over their normal bodies. McMonagall's telling us that the beings he remote viewed had three fingers. This corresponds to what eyewitnesses told us a couple of months ago when they encountered extraterrestrial. So now you have to ask, are there aliens at Orton? The actual USOs that I perceived that were adjacent to or very close to Autech contained possible entities that were not human. I'm just curious, what about the Autech base itself? Is there anything you can tell us about what you reviewed at Autech? Maybe what, what they're actually doing there? I do know what's going on there, but much of it is classified, so I would never disclose it. Is there anything happening with respect to extraterrestrials at Autech? I'd say I can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we need to find someone who can break it all down for us. Who's doing what and why? How are you, Max? Maximilian de Lafayette is a French ufologist who's written numerous encyclopedias about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and time travel. You said you know the secret from your sources of what Autech is and what is going on at Autech. Government is saying that they conduct exotic, aquatic, sophisticated weapon. It's much more than that. It's a nest for contact with uh, alien. Between the 17th and the 22nd of September 1958, mm -hmm. during the administration of President, President Eisenhower. Eisenhower, they had a meeting. When you say they had a meeting, who is they? They were extraterrestrial, they are from outer space, from different dimensions. According to Maximilian, back in 1958, 
U.S. government officials had a secret meeting with extraterrestrials, and the very next year, the order to build Autech was given. The timing of both events strikes me as more than coincidental. They told them, we, the alien, we are going to give you some, some remarkable secrets in exchange. Don't interfere with us when we appear in your skies. If we have a free access to your world, we will have access to very advanced technology. Maximilian is telling us some pretty unbelievable things, but I'm willing to bet that there's not a single scientist in the world that will go on record and back him up. I need to know what your sources are for this information. Uh, so I give you my, my sources. Uh, probably this is be the last time you will see me, or anybody else will see me. OTEC, it's a laboratory of extremely exotic, avant-garde, multi-dimensional, multi-parallel universe technology. The U.S. military working on, and perhaps working with, alien technology. Where have we heard this before? Area 51. Is Autech something like a portal where there are yeah. doorways into other dimensions? Yes. It's an entrance and exit to multiple universes. A gateway. A gateway. Well, there is a theory about this, about Autech, the energy and the alien and the program. They built their Autech on the top of Atlantis. As you know, the shape of, of Earth shifted many, many times. Atlantis is dispersed in so many places in the world. Wait, wait, wait. So the theory then is that somehow Atlantis was part of a unicontinent, which then separated when the tectonic plate shifted. Correct. This part of what Maximilian says is based in science. There was a single continent millions of years ago, Pangaea. Everything else, you have to keep an open mind and just evaluate the proof. Any small piece of Atlantis, whatever it is, can produce certain electromagnetic, they call it hydroplasma, that can suck up many things and produce energy. Part of Atlantis is there. Who lived in Atlantis? They were extraterrestrial. I mean, isn't it a bit much? Aren't we like, are we reaching? Are we trying to like roll every possible theory into one giant UFO burrito? The only thing it has to do with Autech is location. It's happening all in the same area. Is there some ulterior thing going on here that has to do with extraterrestrials and Autech and the Navy? I can't say that. Right now I'm just seeing coincidences. And then to top all these coincidences or this location business off, there's the uh, likelihood of some kind of interdimensional portal here. We've got to talk to somebody else who maybe knows more and can help us link ETs, USOs, and Autech. I'm Bruce Gernon, a pilot, and I have traveled through time. On December 4th, 1970, pilot Bruce Gernon claims to have flown into the future. He had more than 600 hours of flight time under his belt when it happened. He chronicled the entire phenomenon in his book called The Fog. It all began right here at, at this airport on uh, December 4th, 1970. And we took off and we were heading direct for Bimini. I noticed uh, right in front of my flight path, there was this uh, strange looking cloud. It was a lenticular cloud, but it was too low to be a lenticular. They usually form at 20,000, and, and this was only about 500 feet above the, the water, maybe a couple miles offshore. Mm -hmm. And it looked harmless. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and climbed right up over it. Lenticular clouds are stationary lens-shaped clouds that form at high altitudes. When they're densely packed and symmetrical, they can look a lot like flying saucers. I'm going 110 miles an hour climbing, and I looked around and I noticed this small lenticular cloud had spread out at an amazing rate. And it was like on either side of me as far as I could see, and, but it was also building up. 
I was at almost 11,500 feet, and then I, I broke free. I look in front of me, and now here's the same type of cloud, and it's built up to way over 50,000 feet. Then the tops met, and it formed this huge tunnel. And it was at 10,000 feet to the center of it, and it was like over 10 miles long. I went ahead and penetrated into it, and it was full of electricity. And what makes you think the clouds were full of electricity? Well, there were these flashes that were going on there, and they became stronger and stronger the deeper I went. And that's when I started traveling forward through time. When I was about 100 miles from Miami, I entered what I call a time tunnel vortex. And I started going forward through time. I had decided to go ahead and penetrate into this. And try to get through it before it closed. And it should have taken me three minutes at least to reach the other end of the tunnel, but it only took about 20 seconds. And when I got there, it had shrunk to only about 30 feet because the wingtips scraped the edges of it. And then I looked at the tunnel and I watched it collapse. My three navigational instruments were all malfunctioning. And even the magnetic compass was slowly rotating counterclockwise. And, but my radios were still working. So mm -hmm. I contacted Miami Radio. And I told him I was about 90 miles east of Miami. And then he comes back on the radio, and he's yelling really loud. He says, I've got an airplane directly over Miami Beach. When I landed back at Palm Beach International, I discovered that the flight took 30 minutes less than I had ever made that flight before, and I had made that flight at least a dozen times before. Do you have any evidence to support this claim of time traveling? Yes, I discovered that when I arrived, I had 10 gallons of extra fuel. Isn't there uh, any other explanation for this? I mean, isn't it possible that, the, that you went through some kind of huge storm and maybe some kind of tailwind pushed you closer to Miami, saving you the fuel and, and bringing you to Miami uh, quicker than you expected. I was 100 miles away from Miami, mm -hmm. so to go to Miami in three minutes, I'd need to, uh, the wind would have to be close to 2,000 miles an hour. Wow, I see. Based on the information that Bruce gave us, a normal flight from Andros Island to West Palm Beach takes about 75 minutes to travel the 210 miles. His entire trip uses 38 gallons of fuel. Gernon actually flew 250 miles in 47 minutes and still had 10 gallons of fuel left when he arrived. This means that the A36 plane that he was piloting would have had to travel at 319 miles per hour to make this trip in 47 minutes. But that would have been impossible because Bruce's plane had a top speed of 234 miles per hour. Based on these numbers, Bruce's plane would have just been ripped apart by the stress. Do you think this was a result of an Autech experiment or just some natural thing that occurs around the Bermuda Triangle? It could be a combination of both. Altec could be experimenting with something that's a natural phenomenon. The Bermuda Triangle has a long history of craft mysteriously vanishing. December 1945, Flight 19 disappears over the Bermuda Triangle while on a training mission. June 1950, the 300-foot cargo ship, the Sandra, is never heard from again after sailing into the Bermuda Triangle. May 1968, the U.S. Navy submarine Scorpion goes missing, and she never reaches port in Norfolk, Virginia. Maybe it's not a natural phenomenon after all. What if a lot of these reported events can be linked to Autec? We're meeting with physicist Dr. James Webb, professor at Florida International University. He's going to talk to us about the possibilities of time travel. General relativity has opened up a whole can of sort of worms, uh, the ability to have wormholes to, to connect other places. Dr. James Webb has been lecturing all over the country, traveling from university to university, explaining the physics of time travel, black holes, and wormholes. People have been you know, interested in black holes uh, for a long time and explaining things in outer space. And there are certain characteristics 
As a star collapses, all of its mass and its gravity remain. These forces are so strong that, that not even light can escape. Normal black hole physics does not allow anything to go in there without getting tightly ripped apart and destroyed. However, uh, people playing around with the mathematics have uh, introduced uh, electric and magnetic fields, have introduced rotation. At least mathematically, you can actually maybe survive the trip and go through. These tunnels, uh, these wormholes as they came to be called, can, can either connect in our universe or in other universes. Here we have a bona fide university physicist telling us that mathematically, time travel is possible. So perhaps pilot Bruce Gernon's story is in fact a reality. Uh, if we want to form a black hole, we have to take some mass and collapse it down. And we can actually collapse this down and punch a hole into the fabric of space-time. This would lead to some other dimension. And so this would be the center of the black hole. How does that turn into a wormhole? Well, if you have another one on the other side that meets up with it, then you have it leading to another piece of space-time underneath. You could take the trip and go around the long way, or if you could survive the trip, you could duck down through, pop out instantaneously down here. You would travel this entire distance without ever going through space-time at all. Here's what we know. The possibility of time travel exists. And if what Max says is true, that Atlantis had some alien power source, then we need to find proof of this ancient civilization in the waters near Autec. Hi, Greg. Hi, Laura. How are you? Bill, how are you doing? Good to meet you. Thanks for seeing right. us today. Hey. Dr. Greg Little and his wife, Laura, are part of an organization called ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment. So what are you guys doing here in the Bahamas? I hear you've made 200 dives. What are you looking for? Atlantis. Ah. The ARE believes the Bahamas were a part of, of Atlantis, according to Edgar Casey, and this was one of the, the main areas of Casey's Atlantis. Edgar Casey was one of the most famous psychics that ever lived. He predicted that one day Atlantis would be found near the Bahamas. What would you need to find yourself to convince you that Atlantis was based in the Bahamas? Well, something we could carbon date. All we could hope for would probably be some stone foundations. So have you found anything interesting, any, any evidence of that? We were here in 2003, and a, a dive operator came to talk to us one night, and when he found out we were looking at, at anomalies like the Bimini Road, which he was familiar with, he uh, told us that there was another similar formation right out here in Nicholstown. And so we uh, went out and Greg snorkeled and discovered what looked to him to be large megalithic blocks. I'm a diver, I'd love to join you and, and have a Good. look and see what, what we can see down there. We're here in Nichols Town on the northern part of Andros Island, about 30 miles from Autec. Back in 2003, Dr. Greg Little and his wife Laura went diving here looking for the ruins of Atlantis. And what they found could be the remnants of an ancient civilization. So we'll be diving at about a depth of 20 feet. And visibility will be about 20 to 30 feet because the water's a little cloudy. And we've got full tanks of air, and we'll be diving about 300 feet off the shore of Nicholstown. We're about to capture this underwater structure on high definition for the first time. Well, we found something. It's some kind of stone formation. The first thing I notice are these right angles that make it look like these stones are carved. These stones are huge and appear to be layered one on top of the other to form some kind of platform or structure. And last, the structure seems to go off hundreds of feet into the distance. Whatever it is, it definitely looks like it was intentionally built. So 
So to really get a better understanding of what you've got here, it's going to take a lot more work. Yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of work. And really, you have to look at it when it's uncovered. And we saw it when it was pretty much totally uncovered. Right at, and it, it was actually a hurricane that uncovered it. So Greg and Pat, show us what you saw down there. All right, Dr. Little and I entered the water and he led me to uh, what looked to be kind of a structured surface slightly raised above the ocean floor. It's noticeably different. It's, uh, it's kind of smooth, uh, it's segmented, you know, and, and, it, and it, there seems to be a, a direction to it. Like it's, it's not just in one area, but it actually goes off into the distance. Did you see right angles and straight cuts? But yeah, absolutely we did. And then you could look off into the distance and you could still see more of these, these straight lines. So did so, you get the impression that it was man-made or natural? Well, certainly it's enigmatic. You know, if I was diving this spot alone and I, I didn't know what it was, I would think it was, it was really weird. Can we discount the possibility that it is just some unusual type of reef? It's not a reef by definition. This is beach rock. And we know that because we were able to carbon date it. They pulled the shell out of the beach rock. It's 4,000 BC. Dr. Little actually had the stone structure carbon dated. And it turns out it's 6,000 years old. And it points to the existence of a civilization that isn't documented in human history. What do you think that is? I think it's a harbor that was in use around 3,000 BC or so, maybe 4,000 BC. It's sitting on a natural high spot where they brought in beach rock and laid beach rock down to create an enclosed harbor area. Is it a coincidence that what looks like a harbor built by intelligent design well before any documented civilization was here in such close proximity, not only to the reported home of Atlantis, but also to an alleged time portal? All this revolving around a secret base at Arte. Yes, there are some very unusual things going on around Autech, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any kind of extraterrestrial involvement. I mean, at this point, all we have to go on is eyewitness testimony of strange lights in the sky and under the water. That's it. There's no proof that the government is working with aliens at Autech. All we have is testimony by some very credible witnesses, but there are no videos, no photos, and no tangible evidence. What about the testimony of decorated military remote viewer Joe McMonagle? I mean, I don't think we can ignore this at all. Every single major government agency come to this guy for information, and the information he is giving us is that there are USOs, UFOs, he's even getting images of aliens piloting these craft. The picture we put together is that Autech is much more than a military base. We have former Autech employees telling us about this strange, unexplained craft that they saw. Extraterrestrial involvement seems like a real possibility here. No matter how you slice it, any which way you go, the Navy chose to put that test center in that place, remote, guarded. Nobody can get there. Who else do we know that did that? The Air Force, putting it their own test center at Area 51 in Nevada. Air Force Area 51, or Tech, is the Navy's Area 51. There are six billion people in the world, and the possibility of seeing a UFO in the sky is pretty likely when you think about it. But underwater, the possibilities of seeing a USO by comparison are infinitesimal. We know more about the surface of the moon and even Mars than we do about our own oceans. I think our investigation has conclusively shown that what's going on at Area 51 in Nevada is going on here. The U.S. military is quite possibly working with aliens. Autech really is the underwater Area 51.